Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's get started with a multiple choice question. So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's talk polyps, because these are commonly tested pieces of pathology that we need to know, uh, and we need to be able to recognize the different types based on their descriptions. So let's take a look at what we need to know. Now, first of all, remember that grossly speaking, colonic polyps are going to be classified according to certain shapes, like flat, sessile, pedunculated. And when it comes to classifying them further, we are going to rely on histology to do so. So if we break these into those that are typically non-neoplastic and those that have malignant potential, under those non-neoplastic types, we're going to want to recognize the hamartomatous polyp, the hyperplastic polyp, the inflammatory pseudopolyps, uh, mucosal polyps, and submucosal polyps. And then those with the highest malignancy potential are the edematous and the uh, serrated. So there's two under that category. So let's take a look at what we need to know. The first one I want to discuss here is the most common polyp, which is the hyperplastic polyp. Now, for the most part, these are smaller lesions and mainly found in the rectosigmoid region of the colon. And it is possible that on occasion, you'll see that these may evolve into both serrated polyps and more advanced lesions. Next, let's take a look at the hamartomatous polyp, which is a polyp with distorted architecture that grows out of normal colonic tissue. Now, this is associated with two commonly tested conditions, which are putz jagger syndrome and juvenile polyposis. And this is going to present as a solitary lesion. We'll talk about uh, putz jagger and juvenile polyposis shortly. Um, the inflammatory pseudopolyp is actually caused by mucosal erosion seen in either um, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, so either the IBDs. And basically, you're going to see a section of normal mucosa that appears to be raised. However, it only appears that way because the tissue around it has atrophy. And remember that this is a pseudopolyp, meaning it's not an actual legit polyp. Mucosal polyps are next, and these are typically smaller than five millimeters, and they look like normal mucosa. So remember those two facts, and you should be able to identify this one. The last of our non-neoplastic polyps is the submucosal polyp, and this is a type of polyp composed of a single tissue type, and that can include lipomas, leomyomas, neurofibromas, or mucosal Schwann cell hamartomas. Now, if we move on to our two polyps with the greatest potential for malignancy, first we have the adenomatous polyp, which is given rise to via mutations of the APC and CRAS genes. And if this demonstrates villous histology, it has less malignant potential than one with tubular histology. Now, right in the middle is one with tubular villous histology. That will demonstrate an intermediate potential for malignancy, which makes sense. The serrated polyp is characterized by its sawtooth pattern with epithelial dysplasia. And the CPG island methylator phenotype is a described mechanism for tumorigenesis and mutations cause microsatellite instability and BRAF mutations. Let's move on to the next question. Another multiple choice. Go ahead and hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Your correct answer here is B. So let's take a look at the polyposis syndromes which come up a few times throughout some of the other lectures, but makes us do a review here, so let's dive in. So first up, we have FAP, which don't forget is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and is the result of a mutation of the APC tumor suppressor gene. Now, do you remember which chromosome this gene is found on? Chromosome 5. Now, as with a few other commonly tested conditions like retinoblastoma, this condition follows the two-hit hypothesis. So what we're going to find in a patient with FAP is what? You will find a ton of polyps that begin after puberty, and into the thousands of polyps, in fact. And they are um, pancolonic and always involve the rectum. Now, this is the condition where the only way to prevent this is with a colectomy. Otherwise, there is a 100% chance that this does turn into colorectal cancer down the road. Next up, we have Gardner syndrome. This is another AD, autosomal dominant inherited disorder. This is caused by a mutation of the APC tumor suppressor gene. And this is a form of FAP that's also characterized by bone and soft tissue tumors, by congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, as well as the unique finding of impacted and extra teeth. 
Next up, we have Turcot syndrome, and this is another condition characterized by the presence of multiple adenomatous polyps in the colon. As well, it comes with an increased risk of both colorectal and brain cancer. Now, this might be associated with both FAP and or Lynch syndrome. As with our first two conditions, this too is associated with a mutation in the APC gene associated with FAP, or it could be associated with a mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes, MLH1 and PMS2, that are associated with Lynch syndrome. Now, let's talk about Lynch syndrome since it's associated with Turcotte syndrome. So remember, this is formerly known as HNPCC, so you want to make sure you recognize either or. And how is this inherited? Well, like the ones we've already talked about, it is autosomal dominant. And there's going to be around an 80% chance that someone with Lynch syndrome eventually develops colorectal cancer, always involving the proximal colon. It's also important to remember that Lynch syndrome is also associated with cancers of the ovaries, endometrium, and skin. Next up is putz jagger syndrome. This is also inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. So guys, if you get a genetics question with any of these polyposis syndromes, you're choosing AD all the way. All right, so it's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, and it's characterized by the presence of many hamartomas throughout the GI tract, in addition to hyperpigmented macules that are found on the lips, the mouth, the hands, and the genitals. This is one of the very characteristic, unique things about putz jagger syndrome. Now, this condition is going to be associated with an increased risk of both breast and GI cancers. The last of the polyposis syndromes is juvenile polyposis syndrome. How do you guys think this is inherited? This is autosomal dominant, and it's associated with high numbers of hamartomatous polyps in the stomach, the small bowel, and the colon. And the key to remembering this one is that, of course, it happens in younger people, typically under five years of age. All right, let's move on to the next question. We got a multiple choice. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back and we will discuss the correct answer. All right, the correct answer here is D. Now, before we go into the details of colon cancer, don't forget about the molecular pathogenesis of colorectal cancer, whereby we have a couple of instability pathways that lead to colon cancer. We have the chromosomal instability, uh, the microsatellite instability, and the CPG island methylator phenotype pathways. Now, most of your cases of colon cancer arise from that chromosomal instability pathway, which is characterized by several mutations that lead to eventual carcinoma. In this pathway, APC gene mutations cause FAP in most of our sporadic colorectal cancer cases. Now, when it comes to colorectal cancer, remember that most patients are over 50 years of age at the time of diagnosis, and around one out of four who get diagnosed have a family history. That's why it's so important to ask, or in the case of our exams here, look for a family history of colon cancer. Now, as far as screening goes, if we have a patient with an average risk, meaning they don't have a first degree relative, then typically we start screening at 50 years of age via colonoscopy. Now, there's other ways we can test, but colonoscopy is going to be your best, your best um, screening tool. Now, don't forget that one of the classic questions given in an exam uh, vignette is the barium x-ray finding, and it is going to be that classic apple core lesion. Okay, just wanted to throw that in there. Now, oftentimes, they also like to ask you about the CEA tumor marker. And most students know this by now, it's, it's an old trick, but don't forget, this is to monitor the recurrence of cancer or the, um, the progress with treatment, but it's not a screening tool. Now, let's say someone has a first degree relative, right? Uh, with colorectal cancer, of course. We are then going to either screen at 40 years of age or 10 years prior to the age when that uh, first degree relative presented with their cancer. So let's say you have a first degree relative who was 38 years old, at the time of uh, diagnosis. So based on what I just told you, we are either going to start at 40 or 10 years prior to the age when the first degree relative presented. So if it was 38, 40 would be two years later. So we're actually going to do 10 years before, okay? Easy, uh, easy question to make sure you get right on exam day. Now, one of the important findings that should tip you off to the possibility of colorectal cancer is either a male over 50 years of age or a postmenopausal female who has developed iron deficiency anemia. Now, obviously, this is in addition to those other classic findings like bloating, rectal bleeding, weight loss, etc. 
Now, aside from a relative with a history of colorectal cancer, some additional risk factors that you really want to be on the lookout for in a vignette are history of tobacco use, uh, a poor diet that was um, that was and or is still high in processed meats, um, low in fiber, someone with a history of uh, IBDs, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, in which case we're going to actually start uh, screening much, much earlier in those individuals. Now, one final nugget that I want to leave you with here is to remember that that patients with colorectal cancer can also have bacteremia or endocarditis, in which case a common culprit is actually going to be uh, strep gallolyticus, formerly known as strep bovis. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got a multiple choice. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is A. So we talked a bit about cirrhosis and portal hypertension earlier, but let's just do a quick review here. Now, first, I want you to keep in mind that in this specific question, while many of the options are associated with cirrhosis, and cirrhosis is, of course, the most common cause of portal hypertension, option A, which was schistosomiasis, is the only option outlined here that is a direct cause of portal hypertension. Okay. So let's take a look at cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So first, remember, cirrhosis is a condition oftentimes caused by alcoholism, a history of viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, biliary diseases. We can get a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and certain genetic or metabolic diseases can also cause cirrhosis. Now, a cirrhotic liver demonstrates diffuse bridging fibrosis and regenerative nodules that disrupt normal liver architecture. Now, this condition does increase one's risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, portal hypertension is, of course, seen when the pressure within the portal venous system is increased. Cirrhosis is typically your most common cause here, but other causes might include vascular obstruction or, as this question alluded to, schistosomiasis. Now, don't forget that the TIPS procedure we talked about uh, already is a procedure that we can do to reduce both portal hypertension and its associated complications. Now remember what we do in this procedure. We're going to connect the portal vein to the hepatic vein. That helps us bypass the liver. We don't have to go through that, that high pressure system. Now one of the complications that can happen in those with cirrhosis that you really want to keep in the back of your mind when it comes to your exam is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And this is a potentially fatal bacterial infection and it's most commonly caused by gram-negative organisms. Now, what you wanna watch for, in addition to the common signs of infection, like fever and chills, is abdominal pain, ileus, and encephalopathy that is worsening. Now, diagnosing this when you're suspecting its presence will be via paracentesis and an acidic fluid ANC of over 250 cells per millimeter cubed. Now, if you're asked what you should administer empirically when you believe that this is going on, what is your answer? Just choose a class, not even a specific drug. A third generation cephalosporin. All right, let's do one more question and then we will take a break. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back and we will discuss the correct answer. The correct answer here is D. So one of the easiest ways to recognize what they're trying to get you to identify in a vignette when it comes to liver pathology, or really anything related to liver pathology, is to recognize which serum markers and enzymes are altered as a result of a certain problem. So we need to know this stuff cold. Otherwise, when you see it, confusion sets in, you start to second guess yourself, and then you can't really move forward with a vignette confidently. And that is why details do matter. Anyone who tells you to know concepts and forget about details is not doing you a favor. Details do matter. So let's break down um, these, these, um, these values or these, these changes in these um, enzymes or, or these markers so that you are comfortable with this stuff. So remember, most liver diseases will demonstrate an ALT that is greater than an AST. However, in alcoholic liver disease, you're gonna find that an AST level is greater than the ALT level. So it kind of reverses. Now, if your patient's not a drinker, but the AST is still greater than ALT, this is likely the result of either an advanced stage of fibrosis or cirrhosis. Now, if we get a massively elevated amino transferase level, let's say over 1,000, then you should consider that we're dealing with a case of drug-induced liver injury, um, ischemic hepatitis, acute viral hepatitis, or autoimmune hepatitis. 
Now, what if you see an elevation of alkaline phosphatase? Now remember, alkaline phosphatase can be elevated in bone diseases, infiltrated disorders, and in conditions resulting in cholestasis. Similarly, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase will be elevated for similar reasons to alkaline phosphatase, but not in bone diseases. It is, however, associated with the use of alcohol. That's something you really want to keep in mind. Now, moving on to the functional liver markers like bilirubin, albumin, uh, PT, and platelets, don't forget that you're going to see a rise in bilirubin in a variety of liver diseases, as well as in any case whereby we have a breakdown of red blood cells. Now, if you see a drop in albumin and or platelets, this is indicative of a state of advanced liver disease, whereas prothrombin time would be increased in the same scenario of advanced liver disease. All right, make sure you know that stuff cold. It will help you go two, three, four levels deep in a vignette. Let's take a break, and I'll see you guys on the next lecture. Thank you.